and welcome to the Vlogging Pod. Today we are joined by award-winning, winning, I'm having a lot of typos now, <laughs> columnist, author, and publisher, Robert Gaines. Welcome, Robert. I, I want to make it clear, I'm not a communist, I'm a columnist. <laughs> Just so we know. <laughs> you know, if I didn't... Um, I don't know. Sometimes when I speak, my tongue yeah. just, I get twisted, you know, and then yeah. I'll have to like repeat it to myself. Even before I do these, I actually practice in here in the sound booth before I bring you on. So that's well, just, well, you know, that's, that's the great thing about writing is because you can go over your mistakes and nobody knows. Right. In this kind right. of format, you're like, well, it's out there now. <laughs> you said it. <laughs> That's all right. I usually try to correct and, um, yeah, you know. that's a good idea. Yeah, oh, I do. Sure. <laughs> all <laughs> right. Um, so, uh, let me first say that in your bio, you, you traveled quite a bit growing up in a naval family. That's right. Okay, so you went from California, Rhode Island, Virginia. What I'm most curious about, and this actually took me a little bit, because you didn't give me it in your bio, so I had to look a okay. little bit for it. Okay. Um, what I'm most curious about is how did you go from Pennsylvania to McCall, Idaho? Oh, <laughs> well, I went by way of Virginia. How's that say? <laughs> <laughs> when I, 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 uh, my career was at Bucknell University, and when I retired early from Bucknell to be a writer, mm -hmm. uh, you know how that goes, uh, my son was in, and daughter were down in Virginia, and so I went down there to be close to them, and um, then uh, about four years ago, my sister's husband had been, you know, an all-American Boy Scout, and he was up in his 80s, and unfortunately began uh, a process of ne needing help and hospitalization, and, oh. and, uh, and so I went out there at a time that he was having problems, and of course, being with my older sister, she started taking care of me Aww. so i love i just loved idaho i mean the air it's in a mountain town small mountain town and it was just like oh so different than the east nice. and uh unfortunately the bad thing was then then of course the uh pandemic hits and my kids are back east and my grandkids are back east and i'm in the mountains <laughs> which is <laughs> well actually you're the second interview that i've had from idaho Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, so another gentleman I had on the show was from Idaho. And just in full disclosure, I have um, a brother-in-law that lives in Idaho and my mother-in-law and her husband live oh. in Idaho. Oh, well, it's a beautiful, I mean, it's just a beautiful state. And uh, also spent a lot of time in Oregon and Washington. And and, uh, and now, right now, I'm speaking to you from North Carolina. So there. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> You're just all over the place. I am. I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've had an extensive career as a sports columnist. And let's see, this was at the time at the Bucknell University. Am I pronouncing that right? Buck Bucknell, yes. Buck it's Dale? in the, uh, central Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, tell me the full extent of how... How that came about being a well, columnist? Well, it's not easy going from being a sports writer to a um, to to the uh, uh, director director of communications at a, at a university. Mm -hmm. Believe me, <laughs> 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 but <laughs> I got the job, so you know I was really excited. Uh, and we left uh, with our uh, my wife and I and our daughter had left uh, San Diego with earthquakes and all that stuff. We thought we would find a better life back east. I don't know that we did, but things worked out and it was great. Um, I loved working at Bucknell. I worked there for 15 years and, uh, you know, uh, but my experience as a writer was really capped in, you know, as a columnist in San Diego. Right. But then I worked a time with Williamsport Sun Gazette where I went from a big newspaper to sort of a medium newspaper and I was doing, oh my gosh, I was doing editing and, and writing and, you know, the whole gamut of, of what it takes in the, in the journalism business. And I just always wanted to write. I have a whole back history of writing. You know, my my gra 
grandfather, who I never knew, was the editor of the Kansas City Star back way back when. Ernest Hemingway was there, and uh, you know had cousins that were sports writers and such. And so mm -hmm. I was wanting to be a writer. And um, even when I was um, in junior high school, you know, I was thinking someday I'm going to be a writer. And I realized, you know, it's just it's just doing it. It's just doing it. Right. It's, going to college can help, I guess, can help sort of <laughs> slow you down, maybe. But <laughs> the best you'll get there. <laughs> right. Well, I, I did a little college myself. I just had a couple of semesters, but I, I ended up having to quit for other reasons. Um, oh. But this isn't about me. This is about you. <laughs> well, no, I almost, I almost, seriously, I, I joined a fraternity, you know, at San Diego State. I almost flunked out my first semester. Really? I came to the realization that Either I study or tell my father I flunked out. Oh. <laughs> it would be a lot easier to study. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't going to dare face him. I, I think the <laughs> thing is when you start college, I mean, now me, I was a lot older. I already had a kid and I was married. Oh, so yeah. I did an online kind of thing uh, for a couple of mm -hmm. semesters. But I think when you're young and you start college, um, I think it's freedom and we kind of get carried away a little bit. Yeah. And because like my sister, when she went to college, um, you know, or, or you, you end up getting so involved in the partier side or the freedom side that right. you forget about the studies. So I can well, see. Yeah. I, I think it's I had a, no idea. I had no idea why I was there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still in high school, so I go to college. You know? And uh, looking back, I would have done it a lot different. <laughs> believe me. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. Um. So let's let tell me about how a columnist turns to writing classic literature. I mean, that has to be the most distance in format. Yes. Uh, yes, especially sports writing. Mm -hmm. um, but um, at the same time, I've, I've never I've, my mind has never been one to slow down, and so I've always had you know people say you're so aloof. You know, I'm just thinking, you know, I'm not aloof at all. I'm just thinking. And you think actually, I, when I was doing some research on you, not to interrupt, but as okay. I was doing, you are really are aloof. I was like really digging for stuff on you. <laughs> <laughs> just just uh, call the FBI. They call us, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, no, no it, it's just it's just that I've always wanted to be a writer and uh -huh. um, I loved writing for sports. Sports and having my own ability to write for whatever I wanted or whoever I wanted to talk with was great, and it, but it helped form me, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, but but I had these ideas, and I still do. And and I, I wrote my first book actually when I was in my twenties. Never published it. It was called um, "The Man with Total Control," and um, it, it was it was really out there. It was really weird. I, I loved in, reading uh, Kafka. And, Kurt Vonnegut and sort of different kind of, you know, different kind of writing, sort of more of an absurdist, you know, fiction. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love that. Of course, I love all kinds of, of, of uh, reading and, and, and genres. But um, I have, you know, I've written books about my dogs from the 70s. I've written, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I have things go. I've got about nine books in my head that I wish I had enough time to just really get into. Right. Um, but I'm too busy doing other things <laughs> and and that's sort of what happened with this writing is uh i really started writing when my first son or my second child was born and uh, it was just something that i was going through a, a thing at the time you know i was still i wanted to be a writer but i was you know off on another career at bucknell or uh, oh, actually i hadn't started at bucknell yet but i was still writing newspapers and I just felt that I was never going to meet my potential. And it reminded me of back when I was in my 20s, when I didn't even know if I was ever going to have a job. You know, uh, what, you know, you're young. Will I be married? Will I have kids? Will I have a, you know, a career? Right. Will, I, will I ever, you know... Um, oh, find my path and be successful? <laughs> and, um, and so I, I really thought I had the tools and the talents. And that's what I based my main character on, is, is a man who, is, who has all the talent, uh, a piano player, a former baseball player when he was in college in the 1920, <laughs> who, who had this great potential, was from a very famous family, 
um, who the father was a great pianist and the brother was a, a weird, strange writer and the sister was a avant-garde artist and, and their lives, they became very famous and they were the, the, uh, the famous members of his family. And he was better than them at everything they did, but he never tried. And so now that he's approaching a hundred years, it's like it's not it's all it's over, you know, as far as him ever finding himself. And a chance the chance is that a friend of his who, who knows about his all of his writings and wants to edit them um, gets a uh, young um, uh, filmographer, and she's uh, 28 years old and just happens to look like the wife he, his only wife he had in his life many, many years ago. And that was a very tragic story. And he just is old and just loses it and becomes invigorated with his dreams and being able to talk to her while she's doing a film of him, his life as a sort of a celebration for his 100th uh, anniversary year, 100th year. On now, now, just so our listeners know, you're talking about the brave historian, correct? I think so. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because we kind of, I asked you how you got from um, a columnist to writing classical literature. Oh, oh. And that's that fine. No, that's fine, because we were going to get there anyways. It's okay. Okay. It's just a little sooner than I've got yeah. it all scripted out here, but I just want to yeah. make sure that we're, we're letting the, uh, the audience know which book we're speaking about. Okay? Yeah, the Brave Historian. It's sort of funny because I was thinking about this the other day. I started really writing this in terms of a hundred year old man when I was um, not even yet 50. Um, and so uh, it's amazing how accurate I've been okay, so <laughs> in when, figuring things out. When you wrote this at 50, is this because this was a turn for you? Because I know as we get older, like our first is when we first hit 30s and we're like, oh crap, we're out of our 20s. Yeah. And then 40s is another um, milestone. Yeah, so when, yeah. when you were reaching your 50, was this a milestone for you? You kind of felt your own age, why you wanted to reach even farther in a man's age to write this? Well, no, you know, uh, what I do is, is I've always walked. I just walk. I mm -hmm. go for walks, hikes, and I always take a notebook with me. I mean, this is long before that. So I, I write down ideas for when I was writing sports, for just ideas for columns or whatnot, or, you know, just ideas. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always done that. And... Um, it struck me one day about an idea, which really at the beginning of this, it was nothing like the ending. I mean, what I started with was something totally different. My idea originally was just a hundred year old man who realizes he's, he's, he's so gifted and yet he's been a failure, you know, a brilliant idiot. <laughs> and, and, now uh, you're talking about my yeah. life. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> I was figured there was people who would relate to that. But that was mine too, you know. Yeah. I was still thinking that, uh, in those terms, and uh, <laughs> how that would be. But um, the the things just came together, you know. And 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 what was really weird is I wrote this over the years. Of course, again, I'm working at the university. I'm, I'm you know doing all these things. I've got a wife and children growing up, and you know you get involved in all these things. And um, so it took a long time to. I just kept polishing this book and I'd throw it away as oh you know it's you know just like the, just like John Hammond who's the the, the protagonist of the story mm -hmm. you know it's not gonna work it, it, you know and then I'd read it and say oh my gosh this is brilliant and then I'd throw it away <laughs> and then I'd read it again a couple years later kind of thing and I said, oh my gosh this is too good and I just said I've got to write this thing mm -hmm. and I stayed with it um but the um I, I, I guess the thing about it is is the characters got in my head, and right. I think this is true with all writing, and they started telling me what to do. I mean, I literally, they would tell me how to write them, them and, and how to change, you know, their personalities. And, of course, the, the, the girl, uh, Shelley, in this story, she looks at it as a thing, you know, she does not want to, she loves John Hammond, you know, what he's done and, and who he is, but she doesn't want to end up like him. She wants to, win, you know, a film career where she wins an Academy Award and she doesn't want to, his biggest mistake was he never pushed. You know, he never took his talent and pushed it mm -hmm. because he felt his brother already had the writing thing down, his sister already had the art thing down, and his father had the music thing down. 
And, you know, that's, you know, how many people have not reached their potential simply because of that. Right. And that, that was the basis of the story. And, and uh, then I came across a situation where I had gone to, uh, this is, you know, changed course here. Okay. Quick. But, <laughs> Thanks for letting me gone, know. <laughs> <laughs> just so we know, leaving the brave historian, but I had gone uh, from California in the eighth, in the ninth grade mm -hmm. uh, to uh, Norfolk, Virginia, Norview High School. And uh, this was a time the schools had just reopened, you know, within the last eight months from integration, I mean, from segregation to integration. And Norview had eight black students. Well, I came from California where that was no big deal. But right. in Norfolk, Virginia in 1960, <clears throat> it was a big deal. I mean, it was crazy. It was awful the way these kids were treated. Mm -hmm. And um, it, what was really crazy was the way I thought the majority of Virginians were racist. And uh. what I didn't realize is that we were all just scared, a lot of us. And there were a lot of racists, and, and, and it was sort of a, a, a bad situation. But my point is, is that one of the kids from this eight kids, they were called the Norfolk 17, and there were 17 uh, black kids who uh, went to the various schools in Norfolk because essentially the court said, you have to take these kids. But one of these kids became the first black person to play white high school bat, uh, football in the South. Mm -hmm. This is in 1962. His name was Andrew Heidelberg. And I always remembered him and hearing the stories of him. And, and I saw what happened, how a, a place that was so racist took this kid. And, and you know, the thing was, nobody's going to block for him. He's going to get killed. Well, it was just the opposite. Really? There was so much change, so much. And uh, still the other kids were going through hell. But but anyway, so many, many years later, I thought Andrew had died, and I'd written about him when Arthur Ashe died. I wrote about him in a column that got returned to. Right. And then one day I was looking at the, uh, Google, and there he was. <laughs> so I called him up, and I said, hey, and I went down to see him, and I said, hey, you know, I was a year behind him. And I, I said, I, I'd like to write a book about you. And he says, let's write a movie. <laughs> so we did both. And... Um, we got a, I got a literary agent. We got a contract from Random House. And, oh. Um, oh, yeah, great. I was ecstatic. Well, Andrew, having been dumped on his entire life, sort of fought back. And he was a banker, you know, after he'd almost made the Pittsburgh Steelers when he was younger. You know, he made the last cut. Mm -hmm. So he's a great athlete. The fastest kid I ever saw in my life. He was so good at football. And um, so it became, he became a real story. In fact, the newspapers at first, the Virginian pilot called him the colored halfback, ah. which is so, so bizarre nowadays to think about, but the colored halfback. And his story that he told me of growing up was phenomenal. Really? Anyway, so we got, I mean, it's a great story. So we got this contract. I'm ready to retire early from Bucknell to be a writer because Random House. And then Andrew jumps in and gets the whole thing canceled because he wants more money and a better deal. And, oh, my gosh, you know, we're nobody asking for a better deal. Right. So then I was out. At, <laughs> so you got I, I just, so you got real close for a short time and then it just kind of. Yeah. yeah. But, but uh, so I put that on hold and I'd done a, a book that I self-published on Christy Matthewson, the famous baseball player. And I thought it was the greatest thing ever written, you know, because mm -hmm. I wrote it. I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it must it be was, true if we think yeah, it right. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, it got a lot of great. Lot, everybody that read it said, "Oh, this is fabulous and, and uh, phenomenal." And, but I self-published because I was in a hurry, and all the red flags and self-publishing just hit me in the head. I mean, stabbed yeah. me through the heart. Just you know, marketing and all that stuff. It, it was disastrous. So then my literary agent said, "Why did you do this? You should have told me." And so she got me another deal with a, a, a major publisher, mm -hmm. and I wrote a book for them, and I, uh, they put me on their library line. Oh. And, and the book, I guess, was successful because it sold four or 500 copies, and they made money, and they said, we, and we'll sell it, and they were selling it for 40 bucks, and they wow. said, you can buy it for 30. <laughs> like, how can I buy it for 30 and, and, and talk, you know, get people to 
get signed autographs for 40. <laughs> now, <laughs> you're, t- you're talking about like nonfiction. So your agent wanted the This was historical fiction. Oh, historical fiction. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I made my mind up. You know, I got to tell you, I'm still getting the royalties. And I guess I probably, with all the work I put for that book, I'm making at least 29 cents an hour now for what <laughs> I put into it. Well, that's and nice. So that got me to thinking, you know, there's got to be a better thing. And, and I met a person who had a lot of money talked about you know starting a a a, um, publishing company publishing company Mm -hmm. which i did and uh, now now you're speaking about um hidden shelf publishing house hidden shelf publishing house yeah okay yeah and we're doing really well uh we're you know we're not making any money but we're doing really well (laughs) but we're author friendly and that was the idea well when you know when we say we're not we're doing really well for, for i think the majority of artists when you are enter something that you enjoy, to us, that's the success. Oh, right. It might not be the money that you want. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It might not be well, the I money. I wear two hats. I yeah. Two hats. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so as, we're, as you're talking about the publishing company, let's take a moment and talk about the drive to publish fiction through Hidden Shelf Publishing House. Let's speak about how this venture came about directly when you're mentioning it. You said you had a partner. Yeah, and he lasted, he had a lot of money and he really had a lot going on and, and he lasted about a week and a half in doing it and, and said, you know, he, he dropped out. So then I had to scramble, get an investor to help get going. And uh, right, that's right around the time I moved to Idaho. And um, So, you know, I just, I got really lucky, I got to tell you, um, because, uh, uh, my um, the woman who is my publisher has three main women that work for me, and they're all over the country. Uh-huh. The two of them are in Boise, and just I mean, the woman who's the she's 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 amazing. I mean, what she does and how she does it, and um, she, she's she's really good. I, I'm I'm so fortunate to have found her, and then I found another person who had not done any of this stuff yet, but in reading her resume. She looked like the person who had a great future. And boy, I was surprised 10 times over. And the third person is actually my daughter, who you should never hire. <laughs> uh, but she, she has always been a great artist. And she, her, she has put her art into our covers. Uh, she did the, the Brave Historian cover, which you saw. And mm-hmm. then the graphic design was done by uh, Kristen, who is the publisher I was telling you about. Right. And fortunately... None of these women, all in their 30s, and so you can imagine how powerful they are in their ideas, and they have good ideas, um, but they, they, none of them work full-time because they all have kids, right. and they're all going through that being 30 and married thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't have, I've got these great people who can only give me so much time, but we work it out, and then I have, you know, about seven other people that I for specific skills. So right. it's it's been a it's been a puzzle putting it together, but I feel that we've done everything correctly. Well, um, I, except sell books. <laughs> <laughs> I think in the I think in the literary world, it's a little bit different. Um, unless you're a big publishing house. I mean, I know you have a publishing company, but just like you said, um, everyone that you hire has different time management. I think a lot of yeah. times because when it's online, okay, just like for me, I'm. I am self-published, but I have an assistant who works um, whatever hours she can. Because she's not just my assistant. She has several other authors she mm-hmm. works for. Oh, so okay. it's a matter of budgeting your time for what you need. and You know what I mean? I, so I fully understand. And I occasionally yeah. I've had two assistants. But even that, getting them in the same messenger at the same time is a little difficult. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, I was just looking uh, today, in fact, before we talked, I was, uh, we were talking about, we've done a little advertising here and there and seeing what works, seeing what doesn't work. And we're talking about Amazon advertising, which is, which is advertised as being really easy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They've lied because <laughs> I'm trying to figure it out. And it's not as, it's, it is amazing, but it's also not easy. And I, I'm looking for someone you know, who, who understands Amazon AMS advertising and Google. And I was going to do it myself because I didn't, I couldn't find anybody on my staff with time. Yeah. But then I thought, I don't have the time. So <laughs> you sort of, you know, you look for things and try to figure them out. Right. 
Well, we're Thanks. a little we're a little bit over our time. I used to do about we twenty. Are. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're very easy to talk yeah. to, and I well, I would <laughs> I would let you go on for hours, but <laughs> my camera will shut off in about four oh, okay. minutes. <laughs> oh, okay. But what I want to I want to ask a, a couple of final questions. Um, well, just well one basic because I think you covered a lot of the questions. I didn't even have to ask you. You just kind of went with oh, it, and okay. I just kind of let you go. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> That's that's a good interview. Yes. <laughs> well, hey, I just it's yeah. magic. I'm just sitting back with my fingers and I just let you go. Um, what 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 is something um, you would want your listeners to take away from this interview about you? About me? Mm-hmm. As an oh, author. Well, well, you know, people say, "Are you the main character in the Brave Historian?" And the answer is yes and no. You know, I, there are traces of me in there, but it's not me. And I've been very careful to use places that I've been, so I'm very accurate about that. Mm -hmm. And the historical fiction is it's accurate in that account. But but the may the themes that is me, you know. Like when I was young, it was like, oh my gosh, you know, I I don't know what I'm gonna do. I don't know how to do it. I I you know, and and I'm I just went through that for a longest time, and so that's sort of. You know how how the book just 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 flows together, um, and and I and I also you know people that are a uh, hundred years old aren't done. I mean they were oh. once you know they were once children jumping rocks and and with all the dreams and this particular story I gave him a great life. Unfortunately, he didn't follow through on everything he wanted. To. Right. But. Uh, the life itself is very exciting, and, and his dreams, people say, oh, my gosh, you, you write dreams. Just, you know, there, there's a lot of humor in there, and there's also a lot of, you know, I feel I want to attack the senses, make you cry, make you laugh, make you just put a lump in your throat, and, and that's the way I like to write. Uh, so well, it's, it's if, a little lyrical, too. If you write any way, in any which way you speak, I bet it's a very elegant book. It's very elegant, and, <laughs> and hopefully there's no hopefully there's no uh, typos. <laughs> well, I, actually, I have two different. I have, no, I don't think there are any typos. <laughs> we we always think positive on that. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. <laughs> I want to yeah. thank you so much for being on the oh, show, Robert. It was a, a it was a great pleasure to have you on. You are a fabulous thank speaker, you. and we should definitely have you on again. Thank, thank you so much. You're I welcome. really enjoyed it. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you, our audience. I okay. um, look forward to uh, coming back to the show next Thursday as our next show. Thank you again, everyone. Have a great evening. Bye-bye for now. Thanks, Eric. You're welcome. Bye.